Hello, welcome. Taking odds on whether I'm going to trip here with the setup. Uh, hi, I'm Bob Schwartz. I want to welcome you uh, this evening. I appreciate it. I see a few uh, familiar faces. Um, I'm part of uh, Camp Gemini's Applied Innovation Exchange, and we're welcoming you here tonight for our What's Now New York series. Um, I know you don't want to hear from me, uh, but uh, like I said, it's great to see a couple of familiar faces. We've been doing this now, um, kind of a freshly open space for us, so I want to just tell you where you are. You're in Camp Gemini. has about two floors of the building here that focuses on innovation. Um, this is where we work with our clients on their challenges, the disruptive business models that we're all facing, and basically this is where Capgemini, uh, startups, ecosystem, academics, people like yourselves, we get together, we rally around helping clients with their innovation challenges. And I'm part of that team, I'm part of what we call the Applied Innovation Exchange, um, AIE for short, and I just want to welcome you and basically say, hey, we're going to have a great session here, I ask you to engaged. These things are really great. Everyone surprises me. Everyone, I learned something. Don't let me down. I don't want this to be the one that that doesn't happen. Um, but uh, again, I, we're just glad to have you. Um, after the session, we're going to have some additional time for networking, additional drinks, same place you found your drinks before. Uh, find your way back there. Look me up if you want to know more about the AIE or what we do or just to introduce yourself. And I hope you'd be part of our ongoing dialogue here. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to our host, Pete, and let you uh, introduce our speakers. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Bob. And uh, thanks for everybody here. Yep. Yeah. Bob gets little. So I'm Pete Lydon. I am the founder of the media company reInvent. Uh, and we're based in San Francisco. Um, reInvent basically specializes in bringing very high-end innovators together. And what we have created with Capgemini in San Francisco is a series called What's Now San Francisco, which has been so successful over the last few years, we've essentially expanded it to New York here. And the premise of this series is that we basically take somebody who's really a remarkable innovator in a different field every month, and that person comes up and explains what's going on in their field, but also talks about the latest things that they're really wrestling with, the kind of what's happening now in their field, what's happening now in their head. And so we've been doing this, like I say, for a couple of years here. And um, the piece of it over time is that we cross connect people from different disciplines and we get a kind of a network of networks. A big part of the conversation is not just from the presenter, but it's with the people in the room. It's all kind of invite only. You have all been invited because you're somebody interesting that we think has got something to contribute here. And so about half of the evening here, the program is gonna be actually conversations with you. And so this month, in New York here, we're going to be talking about media, uh, close to my heart, uh, a, a, an industry that's really kind of in convulsions yet again. And it wasn't too long ago, that long ago for some of us, that media was a relatively stable industry of you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, it was pretty stable. In fact, when I actually, I was, this is dating me, but when I was a grad student at Columbia, in the journalism school there, there was a track for newspapers, there's a track for broadcasters. And the year I was there, though, we started on typewriters, this is really dating me, and we moved to the IBM PC. So the first little pluck of the digital age prop kind of started to set in right then, at that time, uh, and started to kind of the, the beginnings of this. And then by the early 90s, the, wire, the kind of internet was starting to disrupt the media world. And it was there actually that I met June, June Cohen here. So in the early, kind of that kind of mid to early 90s, again, when everybody was thinking, you know, what's this little group called the um, internet? I remember actually at Wire Magazine, which is where I worked, we had Michael Crichton do a big feature piece on how the newspapers were dinosaurs that were gonna die. And at the time, the newspapers had 20% margins. They were like riding high and they laughed at this goofball kind of Wired Magazine talking about, yeah, right. As though that's all going to class. Well, we know how that story is, actually. But it was at that time that I met June. And she was across the hall from the magazine at Wired Digital. And in fact, she and her team was, in fact, disrupting the entire media ecosystem in that period there. Something we're going to talk about a little bit there. But it's not that June stopped innovating there, which we'll talk a little bit about. She went on to TED. And she is really the person responsible for bringing TED Talks online. And the same thing, the kind of TV world was so fat and happy, and then about the kind of 2005, we started to get YouTube, and then we started this TED Talks thing, and she ended up taking that idea to 100 million views in a year, and then with her later, her partner in this, her next company, 
Darren Thrift, he took it essentially to a hundred million a month, a billion a year, and they basically, you know, the rest is history for that. Now she's now got a new company, wait what, with Darren, and she's essentially one more time going to innovate into the next iteration of where the media is going, because yet again, we're in another tumultuous time. We thought we had figured out the scalable buzz feeds and voxes and fices were scaling and eyeballs and all the stuff that was happening there. They were kind of like the future a couple of years ago, and even now we're watching the whole disruption happen yet again, and we have to think through the next big media models. And with that, we're going to have June come up and uh, help us figure that out. Come on. Yeah. Great. So one of the hallmarks of this series is uh, that we don't get the canned talks. We get the latest thinking. And this is so latest thinking that June has literally was working on it about 20 minutes ago. That's right. <laughs> to finish it up. Well, that's right. We were joking before that Pete kind of smoked me out. You know, there are moments in your career when you're surveying everything, and then you go into, like, deep development mode, and no one sees you for a year or two. I'm in that mode right now, and this is sort of a moment to kind of pop up with my team and kind of talk and share kind of what we're seeing and what we're theorizing and what we're betting on. So it is kind of... Um, raw and fun it's still it's still being written as we as we speak so we'll see which is a good part of the conversation with her and then again we're going to open it up to you and actually leverage your thinking on this whole space so again we, we did both date back to that early kind of time at wired and I, I think it's even though you know people kind of get what was going on there in some level um just take us back there and set the context a little bit because your journey of media innovation i guess I don't know where you want to start the story, but certainly that's not a bad place to start. And essentially, you've been innovating ever since. But, but kind of bring us back to that time of like how, what was happening there at that period. At that. I'll tell you the, the quick story. So when I was in college, I was at the newspaper. By the way, when I was at my college newspaper, it was the transition to uh, all digital pay stuff. We were like the last generation that like ran things through a waxer and then put the front page <laughs> down and sent out big boards to the printer each night, which I miss. Um, the, so I was in college right when the moment when hyper, when you could first put video onto a computer screen. QuickTime was first released in 1991. And me and a couple of other people at our college newspaper decided that um, wouldn't it be interesting if you could move journalism onto a computer screen and if you could read articles while also watching video and you could have the intensity of video and in-depth reporting in print. And I was so fascinated by that. We built this first publication. And, and I think about it often that I'm still fascinated by that. Like, it's still one of the questions that's so interesting to think about what, what keeps happening to storytelling as technology evolves and media evolves with it. And when I graduated, did not want to go into regular journalism. I wanted to do this thing that we then called multimedia. Mm -hmm. And um, I spent around a year after college um, bartending and interning, waiting for someone to hire me, like trying to find some media company somewhere that wanted to hire someone to work at multimedia. And um, that's how I ended up at Wired. I had been reading Wired since issue two. I couldn't get issue one because it sold out in the Bay Area. And I went there as an intern in September of 94. And as I told you before, when Going to Wired at that time, I went to, for them to work at their web company. It was really the first web company. We didn't even call it the web, then we called it, we didn't call it web since we called it a cyber station that we were building. <laughs> and it wasn't a dot, we didn't have words dot com or startup. It was like a cyber station company. I don't even remember what we called it. Our, <laughs> our, our, actually, our president, Beth Vanderslice, is in the office, so she remembers these days. But it was, um, Nothing about it screamed like the next big thing at that time. I actually expected that it was doing something like going in, like the equivalent of going into performance art. It was like something very interesting and obscure that no one would ever understand. And at the time, it really was sort of the prototypical dot com startup. It was in a in a loft in an industrial building. There were still um, uh, uh, women at sewing machines in all of the lofts next to us. It was before everything had been converted. There was pink Ethernet cable on the roof. That, dogs running around, and it was that prototypical idea, what became a prototypical idea of a dot-com startup. And um, that's, where, that's where it began. And it, was, it drew but, a lot yeah, of people. I mean, and again, without getting too much study, the thing about where it was interesting is, like, someone had to invent, like, the right. internet, you know? Or someone had to invent commenting. Or someone had to invent membership. And these are a lot of innovations that literally Hotwired and June and her team actually came up with. It's like someone has, well, where are we going to put an ad? It's like, well, what, are, what about there? What if we clicked on it? It would 
Take it there. Well, that's an idea. No, it's true. <laughs> but anyhow, we're, without getting too nostalgic, yes. I wanted to say this is someone who's a veteran who's been through all of these different iterations. And what we're going to walk through is not just some of her experiences over her course of her uh, career here, but she has distilled for us five big insights, essentially. That I, well, you, know, you tell me what you call these insights, extra, or what? <laughs> As of 20 minutes ago, we're calling them. <laughs> there are five kind of principles for building the next media model. And what um, uh, my team and I have been doing is trying to um, pull together the principles, like the foundations of the bets that we're making, how we read the media industry now. I think a lot of the way from um, coming from our backgrounds that mix technology, that come from TED, we look at media very differently, we think, than most people in the industry. And so what we try to do is distill these five principles that we infuse into everything we're doing and every bet that we're taking, and to share them with you today, in some ways to test them. And um, it, after each of them, we'll sh I'll share some, some clips and some, some media to listen to and share some of what we're, um, some of what we're doing now. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go through this, present it, provoke you thinking, and then we'll roll into a conversation with many of you uh, who can actually give your own thoughts on uh, what's right, what's wrong, and what we can learn from this. But the whole idea here is we're ready for another big iteration. The media model is going under another big shift, and let's help. Uh, let's have you kind of help guide us. So the first one, what's the first one? You want to kind of grab us through this? Uh, right, yeah. So the, the first one I wanted to is a really simple idea, but it's the idea that I, that I took away from my years at Howard, the years in the 90s and the early web, which is that you really have to rethink where innovation comes from. Most media companies are still, I find, very stuck in a model where innovation comes from on high in the editorial teams. It comes from the editors or the directors or the producers, depending on what organization you're in. And if you're going to um, invent your way uh, through this period, you have to find innovation from every corner of the company. You have to consider the visual thinkers, the business thinkers, and the technical thinkers on your team as your equal partners. And again, this sounds obvious, and I think there are a lot of people who would say, yes, I, I, I design it as my partner, and I come up with an idea, and, and he designs it beautifully, or my engineer is my partner, and I come up with an idea, and she builds it. And but, that, but that's not what it's about. It's actually about a much more foundational partnership that helps you build from the ground up. And Hot Wired is the perfect example. If in order to launch, um, it was really Hot Wired was really the first um, professional media website. And so we had to have a partnership between the technologists and the business thinkers and the editorial thinkers to invent the ad banner, which we're all sorry about, by the way, because it's still <laughs> it's still terrible. Like we, none of us can believe that it's still around. But it really. Um, it instilled really deeply in me um, this notion that creativity must come natively from each of these areas. And I think that's one of the things that media really struggles with today is that most media organizations treat their engineers kind of like plumbers, like the people who come and fix the things. And, they're, um, and they find the business staff kind of a little icky. They want to keep their, they love that they bring in money, but they don't want to hear their ideas. And you have to move past that to, to innovate in, um, in media today. Mm -hmm. And um, I might just at that point, if you don't, maybe I'm going to jump forward. Can I, is it okay if I just share for a moment what I'm doing right now so I can just sure. talk about the team? So having, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a little bit from, from the, my years at TED and what we learned there, and also a little bit about what I'm working on now. And just a, a quick note there, so the, having left TED uh, two years ago, a year ago, launched with my co-founder Darren, a uh, content incubator we call it, called Wait What? And the notion is that it's a new kind of media company that will always be inventing new forms of media. So every year we'll invent a few new media properties. They can be in any format. It might be a podcast, it might be a video series, it might be a VR series. And uh, that everything that we create would be genre-defining and original and have the capacity for great scale. And so what we're assembling is um, kind of a team of just storyteller inventors of the kinds of people who love to make stories and love to uh, invent. Um, and for um, both Darren and I, the, the moments in our career when we've done our most interesting work is moments when technology is changing really quickly and we can look just around the corner. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our philosophy as we go through it, but I wanted to mention that and call out Darren and also our head of design, Sarah. And we all of us would love to talk to you as the night goes on. We might have our head of development, Jay, here too, or he might be launching today's episode with our podcast, it's hard to say. So do you have any examples? So, so you wanted to talk about this rethink and um, give yeah. people a sense of what, what, what do you talk about? 
Well, I think I'm just, I think I'm actually going to go on to the next uh, principle in a minute. I think the main thing that I wanted to uh, share that is this notion that you really have to bring every single mind to the table. And actually, I think I'll give you, we had mentioned earlier, I love, um, it's always fun to share failures with as well as successes. So my favorite failure from our days at Hotware was this moment, maybe in 1998, we were relaunching our whole website. We called it Hotware 4.0, because at the time it was 4.0, not that was before 2.0, but it was hot, it was hot wired 4.0. And um, uh, JavaScript had just been introduced, and so we can make things like fly around the, the screen. And so we relaunched Hotware with this new homepage, and we were so proud of it. It was, it was really pushing the edge of technology that you know, at the time, you know, images can move back and forth, and headlines can move back and forth, and it was dynamic. It's different every time you came to the site, and we had buses in San Francisco that were promoting it, and we had a big launch party that we only barely got the site before, and we were on the newspaper. Outwardly, it was a tremendous success. Like people were like, wow, your website. The next day after it launched, our traffic dropped to like a fourth of what we were before. It's an outward success inside utter failure because people couldn't use it. And this is so early on that we hadn't yet, there were actually missing people on the team. And in some ways, this comes to it. We were very good at that time at integrating engineering thinking and business thinking, but we didn't yet have the, the discipline of UX design and user testing and all of these things that we've come to understand that make a website actually usable for someone. And it became a real homework for me of um, not falling in love with your own designs yeah. and um, really having a deep respect for what the user will actually do when they encounter what you uh, created. Nothing teaches that like failure. That's been there many times. Yes. But, um, but that's coming. Um, yeah. Go ahead. So the next idea I wanted to share was the notion of, I think of one of the key principles, like right now we are living in a very um, cr crowded media environment and, a, and a, a, in a media environment that can border on a sort of an outrage machine. There are so many um, tense emotions, dark emotions, and so much ratcheting up of rage that happens in the media that we can and what we're trying to do at Weight Lot is um, something completely different. So most media companies, in thinking about how they reach their audience, they think about hitting a particular demographic, like you're trying to go after a certain type of person in a certain kind of place or serving a certain kind of content. And what we think about instead is not who we're trying to reach, but how we want them to feel. And in everything that we create, we think about how can we evoke contagious emotions, emotions that make me want to share what you are experiencing. And we think of those, we define them as curiosity, awe, wonder, and mastery. That these are emotions that make play to your highest potential as a person, but they also have this secret quality of making you want to share them. And um, I thought what I'd do is I have two clips to share, okay. or two pieces of media to share. One of them is um, a very classic TED Talk. It's uh, around two minutes from a very classic TED Talk. And it was at TED that we first started thinking about this nature of contagious emotions. What was it that made people want to share a TED Talk? In most cases, we thought it was because it sparked something in them that made them want someone by their side. And so this talk, I'm, it's a, this clip I'm about to share with you is a clip from one of the first six TED Talks that went online. It's um, by, some of you have probably seen it. You probably saw it years ago because it came out about 11 years ago. It is uh, by a Swedish professor of global health talking about the third world. It should, um, by the description, be the most boring thing you've ever seen. No offense to global health experts. And yet it isn't. And so I want to share it with you and then um, share a thought on what made this particular unlikely video go, go viral. Um, we're going to start the talk at the moment that Hans is, uh, Hans Ressling is, is about to explain to you um, how to think about the developing world and how the developing world isn't what you um, so go ahead and play. Go. Every bubble here is a country. The, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. This is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Eh? And they said the world is still we and them. 
and we is Western world, and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world, I said. Well, that's long life in small family, and third world is short life in large family. So this is what I could display here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families, and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families, and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see. We start the world. And this is all UN statistics that has been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China. They're moving against better health. They're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries, and they get larger families, but they, no, longer life, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here. They still remain here. This is India. Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh. It's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning, and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. So when, when you watch that talk, it does something to you, right? Especially if you've never seen a lecture like that, especially 10 years ago before uh, when TED Talk, this was the first TED Talk that ever went online. You've not seen a talk like that. You've not seen someone narrate statistics like a sportscaster and his enthusiasm grabs you. And, like, and when the African countries sink, like it, my stomach sinks with them every time. And you also catch his passion and his exuberance at new worlds that we're looking at. And what it makes me think is that you, you feel all these things that moment. You feel mastery. You mastered something you didn't even know that you didn't know. You have this sense of curiosity about this new way of looking at this world. And you're filled with a, also kind of a sense of wonder and awe at this person whose ideas that you're, you're capturing. And when you feel all of that, those types of emotions, there are actually various scientific studies have shown that those are emotions that make you want to share something. And so as a media professional, instead of, this is what we talk about on our team all the time, instead of thinking about how do we clickbait people into clicking on a headline, how do we feed the outrage machine, how do we fool someone into clicking on something or bring them back out of fear, we think, how do we do that? How do we get people to feel something different? How do we get them to say our company and who came about? How do we get them to say, wait, what? What did he say? What is he doing? That's possible? That's the, the feeling that we're going for in, in everything that we, that we do. And it came from, that realization came from those years at TED of watching these lectures, these taped lectures that honestly, when we put them online, nobody thought they would go anywhere, watch them shoot around the world because they lit something up inside people. They made them think in a way, they gave them a new sense of possibility, and that's the kind of feeling we're always trying to capture and that I think is, is worth thinking about throughout the and also how the production values weren't really the key there. It was like, <laughs> this at least. Um, but it was just, it was what's at the core of that thing was the, was the main idea. Totally. And you know, you think about Hans Rissing had been giving that lesson for um, 40 years in classrooms and workshops. And, um, and then he gave it once at TED and it, and, it, and it spread the idea around the world. That's one of the things I'm we're super proud of. We're super proud of it. Um, he went on to give 10 TED Talks that you can watch online. He passed away last year, our, our dear Hans, but it, we're proud to have captured him. Um, let me show you something else along the lines of contagious emotion. Yeah. So I'd love to share something with you. Let's see if we can bring it back. From the first media property we've launched from, uh, from our new company, it's, a, it's the, the first one that we launched and that we own. It's a podcast called Masters of Scale. It features this... Um, 
I mean, I'll say a wonderful character. He's not a character, he's a person, but this wonderful human named Reed Hoffman, he's the co-founder of LinkedIn. He's a kind of legendary Silicon Valley investor. He was an angel investor in Facebook and Airbnb and Dropbox and all of these companies that have gone from zero to a gazillion. But what we love about him is that he is endlessly curious and generous, and he has this wonderful spirit and a mind that moves a million miles a minute. And we launched this podcast as, it's a business podcast, but it doesn't sound like one. We set out to do something that uh, created a different kind of genre that has original music that makes you laugh along the way. And um, in it, we're always aiming for those contagious emotions too. So I thought I would just share with you one um, clip from Masters of Scale. It's an opening clip, so it's going into an episode called The Beauty of a Bad Idea, but I'm not going to tell you anything about it. Just know this is the top of the episode. I've been turned down 148 times. That's Catherine Minshew. Can we start over? I don't think anyone could hear it. Can we take up the volume? Every I have been turned down 148 times. That's Catherine Minshew co-founder and CEO of The Muse, a career development website that she pitched to investors 148 times. Not that she was counting. There were literally days where I had a no over breakfast, a no over a 10.30 a.m. coffee, a no over lunch, you know, disinterest at 2 p.m., um, somebody who left a meeting early at 4, and then I would go to drinks and feel like I was being laughed out of the room. And when we finally raised uh, our seed round, I went back and counted. It was both painful and gratifying at the same time, looking at all those names and thinking, I remember that no, I remember that no, I remember that no, and they sting. Everyone stings. So you have to gird yourself for a string of rejections. Some entrepreneurs simply develop thick skin. Others treat it like a normal part of their workday. You know, wake up, brush your teeth, listen to people crush your dreams. It's a living. Today, the Muse serves users in the millions. Catherine raised $16 million last year, and her tale is the origin story of most great startups. So if you're hearing a chorus of no's, you should look for other signs that you're onto something. I believe that the best ideas often appear laughable at the first glance. So, what I love in that clip is just, it's, it's just so relatable. Totally. <laughs> There's something very funny for us as a tiny startup uh, launching a podcast that is aimed at advice to startups. And there are many days with a lot of no's in them. Um, but this clip also it aims to deliver that kind of, of emotion. It's both, it's, it's resonant. You have a feeling of learning something and feeling of just curiosity and hope, delight when you didn't expect a gospel choir to start singing behind the main <laughs> totally right. yeah. That's wonderful. Well, so, okay, so we've got two big themes. And what's the, can you give us a little flavor of the third theme coming up here? I can. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so going on from, from contagious emotions, another thing that we think about a lot is something we've encapsulated in the idea of thinking natively and scaling horizontally. And what we mean by that is, first of all, thinking about formats. So in today's media environment, you, it, it's no longer wise to simply think in one single format, to think of yourself as a podcast company or a video company or, or a digital um, articles company, not that anyone defines themselves that way. And what we think about, so most companies, most media companies think across formats in some ways. They think about creating one format and then promoting uh, in others. But what we think about is something a, a bit differently here that I want to explain, which is the importance of um, A, knowing that whatever format, actually let me back up for a second with an observation that states something initially that everybody knows, which is that media habits are changing and they're changing really fast. So as you said, media used to be a very stable environment. Now the notion that media habits are changing is not new. This is a 20-year trend that, that we're talking about. But it's happening faster and more uh, we are more splintered than, than we ever have been before. We think there are really new ways to think about how to get around that. So in today's media environment, whatever you're publishing, whether it's an audio, video, um, text, if you're not thinking about other media channels, you're losing most of the audience for the ideas that you're sharing. And so what often happens in media is that ideas are shared and they get locked into the medium that they're developed in. So Masters of Scale, for example, is a podcast 
most people don't listen to podcasts. Um, there's the, the audience is doubling each year. It's growing really quickly, but um, that's not many people's media habit. So for us, we think about how can we move um, the ideas and what we tend to think about is we'll launch media in one platform, in one format, whether it's audio, video, uh, text. And then we think about how do we take that and now think natively how to move it into another medium. I'll give you an example from yeah. the TED. So at TED, TED actually began as a conference. It began, the medium was talks on the stage. And when we put TED Talks online, we, did, we thought very intentionally about how do we capture that lecture and bring it to video. And at the time, I was actually seen as something that, that, not, that couldn't be done. Like, that's what we actually heard from everyone, is who's going to watch a tape lecture. They weren't seen as interesting because most lectures were filmed like a high school musical with like one camera in the back of the audience. And so we thought, how do we think about this natively? How do we think about this cinematographically? I don't think I said that right. Shooting with multiple cameras, having close, tight, uh, tight shots of, of the speaker, giving a editing um, the pieces so that they flow naturally. We really thought about how do you take what worked on the stage and then give everyone the best seat in the house by taking it to video. And then we took it one step further as TED Talks, uh, TED Talks um, took off. We reached a point around five years in, and this is actually when Darren joined TED. He suggested, why don't we move to audio? And at the time, people said, well, why don't you just set up like a serious channel and just run TED Talks back to back or create a feed of TED Talks back to back? And we did that, and we put it on our app, and a few people listened. But the real opportunity was converting it natively into radio. And so we led, Darren led an initiative to launch the TED Radio Hour, which was a partnership with NPR, to not just take the talks and put them on radio, but to really think what is native to radio. How do you create a program that really sings in an audio environment by um, doing multiple talks, doing follow-up interviews, soundscaping it uh, all? And I thought I'd share a clip from, from that, Let's which that. is, um, this is a talk by Phil uh, Platt, late? who um, is talking about what will we do when an asteroid is about to collide with Earth. And when you hear it, um, you'll notice that there, it has been completely transformed and soundscaped into something different than it was given on the, on the TED stage. At 250 meters across, Apophis is nowhere near as big as the six-mile-wide asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs, but it would still obliterate everything within a couple hundred miles. And, if it lands near a major city, that would be bad. Now, the odds of that happening are one in a million, roughly. Very, very low odds. So I personally am not lying awake at night worrying about this at all. I don't think Apophis is a problem. In fact, Apophis is a blessing in disguise because it woke us up to the dangers of these things. This thing was discovered just a few years ago and could hit us a few years from now. It won't, but it gives us a chance to study these kinds of asteroids. We didn't really necessarily understand these keyholes, and now we do, and it turns out that's really important. Because how do you stop an asteroid like this? What Phil Clay points out is that we can't move the Earth. Earth, at least not easily, but we can move a small asteroid. And it turns out we've even done it. That was back in 2005. NASA launched a space probe called Deep Impact right into the path of a comet, which was orbiting the sun. At 10 miles per second, 20 miles per second. We shot a space probe at it and hit it. Okay, imagine how hard that must be, and we did it. That means we can do it again. If we, need, if we see an asteroid that's coming toward us, and it's headed right for us, and we have two years to go, boom, we hit it. <laughs> The problem is, what happens if you, you hit this asteroid, you've changed the orbit, you measure the orbit, and then you find out, oh yeah, we just pushed it into a keyhole, and now it's gonna hit us in three years. Well, my opinion is, fine, okay? It's not hitting us in six months, that's good. Now we have three years to do something else. And you can hit it again, that's kinda ham-fisted. You might just push it into a third keyhole or whatever. So you don't do that. And this is the part, it's the part I just love. After the big macho, er, bam, we're gonna hit this thing in the face, then we bring in the velvet gloves. Little Prince. <laughs> There's a group of scientists and engineers and astronauts, and they call themselves the B612 Foundation. For those of you who've read The Little Prince, you understand that reference, I hope. Little Prince who lived on an asteroid, it was called B612. Shine for me again, little prince. <laughs> These are smart guys, astronauts, like I said, engineers. 
If we see an asteroid that's going to hit the Earth and we have enough time, As we get closer and closer and closer. Then what we do is we launch a probe. It doesn't have to be huge, a couple of tons, not that big. And you park it near the asteroid. You don't land on it, because these things are tumbling end over end. It's very hard to land on them. Instead, you get near it. The gravity of the asteroid pulls on the probe. Closer and closer and closer. And the probe has a couple of tons of mass. Come a it has a little tiny bit of gravity. But it's enough right there and then. that it can pull the asteroid. Gonna touch. And you have your rocket set up. And you basically, these guys are connected by their own gravity. And if you move the probe very slowly, very, very gently, you can very easily finesse that rock into a safe orbit. And closer, and closer all the time. <coughs> wow. So, so was that, that was the guy's talk originally on a stage that you just stripped the audio out and then you added everything that went on to that was all your post-production, basically. It was, and one of the, the clip actually started a little earlier than we meant it to, but there was actually, there was a back and forth that you could just hear um, between the host and the speaker. So the host guy, Roz, was kind of filling in some details to keep the, keep the talk moving along faster and all of that sound was added afterwards. So none of that is in the, the talk that he gave from the stage, but it, brings it to life. His talk was much more visual as well as you can imagine being about asteroids. But, um, but there's this way to bring it to life with audio that totally worked in that um, medium. And also take something incredibly uh, important but geeky and hard to grasp like asteroids and makes it fun and brings it to life in that way. It's interesting also because it's not native to a talk, people don't know what to do when they're listening to radio as a group. I mean, it's, it's interesting to see how people took it in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So, four. Do you have the next one coming up here? I just want to share one, oh. one other clip along this line. So I want to just share another um, way of thinking about moving between formats. So on um, Masters of Scale, the, the podcast that I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we're doing now, we, put a, we invest a lot into creating the podcast itself. But rather than think about it as just like when an episode goes up and then it kind of disappears into the past, everything we create, we think, how can we reuse this? 10 different ways. How can we take what we've already created and find new uses for it, new audiences for it? And so what we're in development on right now is taking key moments in Masters of Scale where a key concept is delivered or a key story is shared and animating it. And so we are um, sort of bringing it to life using its, the using the soundtrack it already has, but putting animation over it to then release a social video online because that social video can find a much wider audience than a podcast can. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I'd share with you um, a clip, another mm -hmm. clip from, okay. from Masters of Scale. This is one that is from the episode called um, Handcrafted. It features um, Brian Chesky, who is the oh, yeah. CEO of Airbnb. And he's a great storyteller. <clears throat> and he has a lot of ideas about generating your own ideas. And so this um, uh, short uh, clip is he's describing how he and his team come up came up with great new ways of thinking about improving the Airbnb experience. And I'm going to play the clip, and then the images you see are just stills that are taken from the animation that we're creating for it. This is in process now. We actually don't have a full animation to show you yet, but you can kind of imagine the way this um, particular clip will come to life. Um, the 11 star experience, that's what this is called. If you want to build something that's truly viral, you have to create a total like experience that you tell everyone about. And so we basically took one part of our product and we extrapolated what would a five-star experience be and then we went crazy. So a one, two, or three-star experience is you get to your Airbnb and no one's there. So you knock on the door, they don't open, that's a one-star. You know, or maybe it's a three-star if they don't open, you have to wait 20 minutes. And if they never show up and you're pissed and you need to get your money back, that's a one-star you're never using. So a little laughter. So a five-star experience is you knock on the door, they open the door, they let you in. Great, but it's not a big deal. You're not going to tell every friend about it. You might say, I used Airbnb, it worked. So we thought, what would a six star experience be? A six star experience, you knock on the door, the host opens, hey, I'm Reed, welcome to my house. You're the host in this case. And you would show them around, and on the table would be a welcome gift. It would be a bottle of wine, maybe some candy. You'd open the fridge, there's water, you go to the bathroom, there's toiletries, and the whole thing is great. 
That's a six star experience. And you'd say, wow, I love this more than a hotel. I'm definitely gonna use Airbnb again. It worked, better than I expected. What's a seven star experience? Knock on the door, Reed Hoffman opened, get in, welcome. Here's my full kitchen. I know you like surfing. There's a surfboard waiting for you. I've booked lessons for you. It's gonna be an amazing experience. And by the way, here's my car. You can use my car. And um, you know, I also wanna surprise you, but I got you, this is the best restaurant in the city of uh, San Francisco. I got you a table there. And you're like, whoa, like this is way beyond. Adding stars clearly excites Brian. It took some time to run through this mental exercise. We'll skip ahead to the 10 star experience. So what a 10 star check-in. A 10 star check-in would be the Beatles check-in in 1964. I'd get off the plane and there'd be 5,000 high school kids cheering my name <laughs> with cars welcoming me to the country. I'd get to the front yard of your house and there'd be a press conference for me. And I would be just a mind <laughs> experience. So what would an 11 star experience be? I would show up to the airport, and you'd be there with Elon Musk, and you're saying you're going to space. <laughs> <laughs> the point of the process is that maybe 9, 10, 11 are not feasible, but if you go through the crazy exercise of keep going, there's some sweet spot between they showed up and they opened the door, and I went to space, that's a sweet spot. And you have to almost design the extreme to come backwards. Suddenly, doesn't just like having like knowing my preferences and having a surfboard in the house seem like not crazy and reasonable? It's actually kind of crazy logistically, but this is the kind of stuff that creates great experience. Mm, that's fun. <laughs> it, it's a fun. It's actually probably the one um, uh, moment or idea in the series we hear people mention more than anything else, just as an idea that they took with them that they use with their team on a regular basis. And so we love the idea of breaking that out into just a standalone uh, piece that can move on its own through the world instead of being locked inside the podcast. And you can kind of imagine how it will come to life with, with visuals. Gotcha. So what's the fourth one for us then? Our fourth one. So um, the next one is something we think about a lot and is probably uh, one of the things we think about most differently from other people in the field. And that's the notion that when we create content, we're not just creating content to put on other platforms. We actually think about creating content that can become a platform itself. So if we think about the way a technologist would define a platform, it's as a service that other people build upon. Other people can build things for a, 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 a platform, like, for example, the, the my phone, I don't have it. The iPhone is it's a platform. People build apps for it. And every time someone builds an app for the iPhone, it becomes more powerful as a platform that didn't require much of Apple. And in fact, they get a lot from it. So we don't think about just creating content that lives on a platform somewhere where we can send uh, eyeballs to. We think, how can we create content that other people can build upon? that our audience can build upon and that partners can build upon. And we think about this in two ways. It's a kind of a tricky um, uh, concept calling it that. So I want to explain what I mean by it. I think there's two ways to think about it. Um, a brand, Ted is a great example. So Ted, um, what Ted became over the years was Ted is not, if you think about Ted now, it's not just a conference and it's not just a video series. I think the right way to think about TED is that it's become a platform for spreading ideas. And each piece of that platform reinforces it. People come to get to TED conferences and give their talks for free because they know that they're going to reach a wide audience. They're going to be distributed online. And uh, even if they, and uh, uh, in addition to the conferences and the video series, there's a series of TEDx events around the world. None of which, they don't pay TED for that. And uh, TED doesn't pay them, but people hold these events for free. People give talks for free. They put their talks online because it becomes part of this ecosystem. Um, along with that, one of the little known things we did at TED uh, that also reinforced the sense of a platform or an ecosystem where you have network effects, where each time someone adds to it, it becomes more powerful. Um, it's probably the lesser known thing that was launched at TED was the Open Translation Project. So along with TEDx, which allowed people around the world to hold their own events for free, we launched, and it's so amazing because Michael Spolins is here, who is the technology have... service, the subtitling service that we launched the Open Translation Project with in 2009, I believe, um, when it was absurd to even try to, but we were getting uh, inquiries from people around the world who wanted to translate our talks. They didn't want us to translate them. They were like, I want to subtitle your talks in Polish. I want to translate your talks into Japanese. And these kinds of requests, usually when you get them in a the company, they're kind of a nuisance. You're like, well, you want to do what? No, you can't do that. Stop bugging me and stop emailing us. 
Um, and that's why we really tried to say, like, how do we, instead of saying no, how do we capture, how do we harness that passion? They want to be involved. How do we do that? And so we um, launched, and actually I'll just show you, this is just a fun little uh, uh, slide. Um, the no so this is the notion of kind of letting your audience build with you. And the TED Translation Project is a perfect example of that. There's, I actually might be out of date with 200,000 translations. It's probably well past that. There are 30, 40 languages where um, 2,000 plus uh, talks have been translated into the other languages. And this volunteer grew into the largest volunteer subtitle project in the world. And it is the reason that TED was able to expand internationally. It is the reason that Darren was able to set up partnerships all around the world because we had this volunteer engine that was translating the talks. And each of those people did it for their own reasons. Some because they just wanted to share the talk with their family who couldn't understand it. Some because they were very proud of their language and their culture and they wanted to be part of the modern world and contributing to TED was part of it. Some were really inspired by the talk and they wanted to contribute to that speaker's cause in some way. So each person had a different reason that they brought to it, but we were able to tap into that and kind of allow the audience to build with us in this way. It was the same thing with um, the TEDx talks. And so that's something we think about in everything we do right now. We um, can't quite talk about it yet, but we're thinking about different ways, like how do we, uh, we're thinking a lot about wisdom. How do we tap people? Everybody carries so much wisdom uh, in them. How can we tap that in a bottom-up way? How can we help the people that people contribute their own wisdom in a way that's meaningful to them? And I'm being a little purposefully vague there, but we're thinking a lot about these kinds of projects that allow many, many people to contribute on a, on a mass level to, to media. Hmm. Do you have a clip of that or no? I don't have a clip of okay. that. And so, um, so we have the fifth one. This is, well, there's a second half. Oh, no. oh so second piece. Okay. There's a second half to it. I think when you think about content being the platform, part of it is thinking bottom up. Like, how do you get your audience to build with you? How do you inspire people and give them the space to build alongside you? And then also works from the top down, um, which is really Darren's expertise. Anyway, how do you partner? with major organizations and allow them to build around what you're doing. So on Masters of Scale, for example, when we launched, um, as each episode launched in our first season, uh, we partnered with Entrepreneur Magazine and they would write articles around each episode and be, be part of that launch. LinkedIn influencers would write a commentary on each episode as it went uh, out into the, the world. The animation series we're uh, working on with Mashable, Eric Porsche is here, and that is, uh, that will, that will be building around each of those as they go out into the world. Most companies are not very good, this is not limited to media, at thinking about how to let other people in. Uh, companies tend to become kind of tribal. You have this idea that like, if it's not invented here, we don't want to do it, or very distrustful of partnerships. You're trying to kind of keep all the traffic to yourself and keep all of the money to yourself, but you, you earn, you gain so much more when you figure out that, that partners can build alongside you. Love it. Partners. Um, okay, and so we got the fifth principle. Is it like from best to worst to the top <laughs> ten or something? Or is this a reveal or something or no? We can rank them. <laughs> okay. You know, so the, the fifth one is actually just bringing it back to a very human place, which is that one of the most powerful and maybe under thought about engines of um, Kind of velocity in the world is the power of first-person storytelling. So when, when I look back and think about why TED Talks worked, I think so much of it had to do with the fact that it wasn't just that it was a lecture, it wasn't just the topics, it was the passion of the storyteller. It was that each talk was about an individual person sharing their ideas and passionately engaging with you on what they believe in. And I think there's a hidden power there. Like there's a very, it's a very ancient part of us that connects to someone who is telling us a story, who is locking eyes with us and guiding us along. Vilification of, of different groups of people. How do you tap into that human storytelling? How do you allow people through their own storytelling to connect to others. Um, I have a clip, and I'm wondering if we have the time for it. It's like a two and a half minute clip. What do you think? Yeah, we could, we could do that. I mean, is, it, <laughs> is it a, what, what kind is it? What is it? It is, um, it's an audio clip. So this is from 
a podcast that we did just before Masters of Scale. It's called Sincerely X. And it was a podcast of anonymous TED Talks. The idea was to find people who had ideas to share that they could not share publicly for any number of different reasons, because it was taboo, because it felt shameful, because it was dangerous. Um, it included the, the, the plot, the series included things like um, a doctor who believed she had killed a patient and wanted to talk about it so that she could bring up the ideas around uh, do uh, doctor burnout that aren't mm. talked about enough. Um, a woman who had um, suffered from PTSD and um, was triggered in a Walmart and um, started pepper spraying other customers who wanted to talk about um, what people need to understand about both PTSD and, and de-escalation skills that are needed. And these were beautiful talks, but not ones that the people could give in a public hmm. venue. And um, what we found in the course of it that we went into it leading very strongly on the idea, and the idea remained important, but it, it really became a story in this, uh, as with everything that said, the power of a real first-person storytelling. Um, each of these people, they weren't famous. Um, nobody knew they were doing it, so they didn't get a lot of their email, but they didn't get a book deal the next day. Um, they uh, really dug deep to, to, to come up with these talks. And just out of curiosity, how did you find them? It was very hard. <laughs> <laughs> it actually was the biggest challenge. And at the first, we thought we would go out and find them. We try to curate the way we did for the stage. But how do you find people to talk about the things that people don't talk about? How do you even know who to ask? <laughs> it, you, you can't. And it ended up being all solicited. So we would just send um, uh, messages out through, through uh, mostly through social media and through email. And then we would filter through all of the responses that came back in. And the people we chose are everyday people. And interestingly, each one of them, when you talk to them on the phone, they were very funny, confident, incredible people who had uh, recovered, from, most of them recovered and rebounded from things that were really devastating in their, their lives. Um, let's, let, let's listen to it and listen to uh, we're going to so, have a conversation. Right? This is a compressed version. It's like the two and a half minute highlights reel from, from actually my, my favorite of the talks. The talk is called... Um, what was the talk called? I'll remember in a moment. Actually, it doesn't matter. You can just listen to it without knowing what it was called. I think we would start with the um, with that thing. Our most intimate experience can be our greatest inspiration. The place where ideas are born. But what if those ideas stay in hiding? What if they never have the chance to be shared? This show creates a safe space for giving talks anonymously. We value ideas over identity, substance over style. You cannot talk publicly about it. From TED and Audible Originals, this is Sincerely X. My name will never go down in history, that's okay. My life was normal by outward appearances, birthday parties, evening meals at the dinner table, church. But lurking under the surface were moments like when he partially dislocated my shoulder for the first time. The arm sling I wore was my own private scarlet letter of shame. I wanna tell you about this ritual I created. And I want to start with the first moment it began. It was the darkest moment in my marriage, in the 15th year. I was standing in the shower with the water pouring down, crying. It's the safest place to cry because no one can hear you. When I felt that everything I worked for, everything I wanted was in shambles, broken, I remember thinking, there has to be something here of value, almost like searching through the rubble to find the life, to find the spark. The first thing I could cling to was the love for my daughters and their love for me. So I brought to mind that love and held my hands to my heart to keep everything from unraveling. Over the weeks and months that followed, I found myself returning to this ritual and building on it. It's a very private ritual and I've never shared it publicly, but here's what it sounds like. I love you, I love you, I love. I love you, I love you. 
instantly, a doctor at the Mayo Clinic said, that what I did was actually quite profound, and that it had a lot in common with mindfulness and meditation used to heal trauma, and it deserved to be shared. I'm not entirely sure how I came up with this ritual, the daily practice of picturing people and holding them close to my heart. Without training, without a self-help book, I followed my own instincts about how to survive. Perhaps most of us know more than we think about what we need, and perhaps the thing I needed most will help someone else. I mean, that piece was, um, from, the, from the first phone call with her, it just grabbed, grabbed at my heart. And hearing her repeat that ritual she had created for herself, and that was, of course, a very compressed version of the talk. But we just happened to send an outreach letter the, the day that she had come back from the Mayo Clinic, and a doctor had told her, like, this thing that you're doing, this thing you invented for yourself, you should share it. And so she wrote off. She was like, oh, I could do a talk on this, and she never expected to hear back. And those... This is just an example, but that kind of story, that kind of vulnerability and, and honesty, I think really speaks to the times that we're in as well. Um, we think about this a lot, this, this power of that really vulnerable first-person storytelling. I know every time that I listen to this talk, I feel like I've dropped down into her kitchen. And she lives in, in the, the Midwest, and we talk from time to time, and she's gone on, she's since she did the Sincerely X Talk, she organizes domestic violence um, conferences. She, it was a real turning point in her life where she took ownership of a lot of things. But um, I felt this incredible just connection with someone that I had never met. And so we think a lot about how to harness that now. And especially now, I, I, I suspect this might, many people here might relate to this, but we actually found when we were founding our company, it was right before the presidential election. And uh, the day after the election, we had a completely different idea of what uh, everything we thought we would be doing, we had to rethink. And a lot of the ideas of the kinds of content we would create um, didn't seem relevant anymore. We had all of these questions, um, new questions and new, new worries and a new sense of different kinds of purpose. And I think that personal storytelling can really play a role in the, the media environment that we're in now. In, in terms of stitching the country back together, in terms of understanding these big chasms between us and stuff? Yeah, I think so. Oh, right. Sorry. I'm like, <laughs> I got so casual. Um, I think so. I think in two, there's two ways that we think about it, but I think there's many, there's many ways to think about it for different people. I think that the, this idea of personal storytelling probably impact many people's work in different ways. So we think about, there's two different projects we're working on. One of them is a uh, uh, a media property that has to do with meditation and mindfulness, that the, there is a, and, and there's an interesting rise in the, the, the mindfulness and meditation movement. I think it has, it was already on the rise and it has been probably ratcheted up by the current political environment of the country. This is just a theory. And so we're developing something that kind of blends um, personal storytelling with um, an exploration of mindfulness. And then we're developing a totally different project that has to do with personal storytelling from across the political spectrum in the US of getting um, real Americans to um, share stories and ideas that other people would find unexpected and surprising, and that will open their eyes to a different way of, of looking at things. Well, I think this is this a good time to transition. Time. I think this is a good time to transition because uh, what you've been kind of teasing out is in your own um, your own experience of what you're seeing that kind of change. But how many people in this room? are tied into the media in some way or have some kind of part of the industry. There's a huge industry here. And New York is one of the big centers of that. So why don't we open it up? We're going to basically give these back and use these. We had a little bit of an issue there, but we, we can still use them. And um, let's just put it out to folks. Hearing uh, any thoughts on what you laid out here, but also you're all kind of thinking, here's one in the back who just already jumped up. Um, your own thinking, though, about what's going on in the media and where can we go, and what are the next models that we really want to build on? So you were kind of laying some foundation of the broader conversation that we're all kind of trapped in now. And when you stand up, could you uh, just introduce yourself, stand up, introduce yourself, identify yourself in some way, and do know that this is going on as live stream, but we're also going to be, we'll always have this uh, available for you folks. So you're all part of the story here. So go ahead. 
Uh, thank you. That was a great talk. And I have a question about social media. And you mentioned. You just, you just say maybe where you're from. Or just oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Juliana. It was working. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Juliana. I'm in marketing. It's not working. I'm going to speak louder. So um, I had marketing for a medical device company. We're um, in a very interesting niche where we're moving towards internet and social media, but we're not there yet. I have a question about social media and using what you mentioned, uh, the one content, one platform, and uh, use it on some other platform. Uh, you mentioned an example video then converting it to audio and using it in different platforms. Social media, how can we use content that we create on Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter? And also, what's your take on social media platforms in general and kind of cross linking them using the same media across different channels? Does that make sense? Because I'll offer a thought or two, and I bet other, other people may have some other thoughts to add. So if you can, maybe we can open. I think it's one of the, the classic opportunities that, that's really important to think both in media and as a company is thinking across actually all of the social media channels that are that are emerging. Um, just a thought to think about over time is that different different channels of social media tend to, to um, pull di a different form of communication and different sets of people. There are people who are Twitter people and there are people who are Facebook people and there are people who are younger than me who are Snap people. And, um, and it's really important, I think, actually, to stay current on them, but also to think natively about them, to really study that medium and what, and what works in it, rather than just sort of pushing the same message out across all of them, to, em to embrace each of them natively. But also to think about the kind of community that you're cultivating on them. Those, um, your, each of your social channels is a kind of community. And, um, and, and you have to think about the, the tone that you're the tone that you're setting, the way that you're the way that you're welcoming people. And so I think it's really worthwhile too. Um, but I also think there is a lot of traps on social media. I think I think there's no question that it's essential um, for thinking about. But there's a lot of problems with. Any questions from here? Let's see, folks here. Okay. Right here. Let's folks put your hands up if you got questions, just so we can kind of understand where the land is. Okay, great. Uh, hi, uh, Alfie Rustam. I'm a, uh, a storyteller, and I'm launching a superhero franchise, um, transmedia uh, platform across multiple. But I was actually uh, uh, before I came here, I ran into a friend of mine, and her father wrote the Elephant Man, and unfortunately he passed, and she's inherited, inherited all of his IP, so she's got the rights to the Elephant Man, and she, she was asking Alfie, "Where am I?" going to do with something like that, an iconic piece of theater. And so I'm just curious if you guys have any thoughts that I can steal from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be maybe an after conversation. Uh, but, but in general, theater is a, I mean, that's a different media. I mean, have you guys thought about how do you integrate it more into that kind of thing as well? Not directly, but I mean, I think you can think about there's a lot of, of movement right now um, Podcasts are selling their the rights to film. Books are turning into podcasts, which are then moving to movies. There's a lot, and this is not a new story. This has been happening for for some time. But that's that's where I, that's that's one way to start thinking about is what what are the different um, platforms where people are consuming who, who are interested in these kinds of stories are going now, and how might this convert into it? Can it be can it be turned into a, a a, a ten episode podcast can it become uh, something that is is serialized in an interesting way to a social channel? Can it um, live in a different way on YouTube? Can it live in print in a way that it hadn't before? So I think there's a very um, just interesting line of thinking about thinking about where the audience is, where where the people that might be touched by the story and reached by the story, where are they, and, and how might we respond to it? And also, we've been talking a lot about the content. I mean, there's a business side of that of this too that's going through convulsion. Um, I don't know if you want to open that up, but uh, this one back here, I see, there's, a, there's a couple in there, but um, but I will say, we've been talking a little bit about all the creative kind of convulsion. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have any thoughts just before we jump into this one on how this kind of starts, the kind of business crisis that media is kind of moving yet again into one more time? <laughs> uh, any, any thoughts on what you're thinking about in that kind of? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think the tr I th well, let me sh I'll share what, what we're thinking about, right? It's rather than sort of what everyone should be thinking, what we're thinking about is how do you create a portfolio of media properties that are really diverse in the way that they make money, right? If you're too dependent on, on advertising, it makes you very vulnerable, and particularly if you're too dependent on um, a, a traditional kind of advertising. So we think about it in several ways. We think with each new thing we're launching, how do we partner with a visionary brand? Sort of a three-act ad that sits inside each podcast. We've actually been told by people that they rewind the podcast to listen to the ad again, which is not something I've heard mm. in my career. But the, the, the point is really thinking natively as you create something new, what could a brand do here? What could a brand that is trying to reach the same audience do in the same space that is creative and insightful and delivers a great message um, and also works? But outside of that, we're also thinking about how do you diversify? Where can you look at licensing fees instead of advertising? Where can you think about user fees? How can you create, is there a marketplace to be um, created? And of course, after, um, you know, media, media newspapers, for example, of course, used to be driven by the classifieds. And all of, one by one, every single thing that the newspapers made money by were um, absorbed and became their own web industries. Uh, you know, whether it's <clears throat> the, the personals or the different parts of, of the classifieds, how do you take some of that back? How do you think about the ways that people can connect in a media environment that might lead to um, more of a marketplace or more of um, a, a, a transaction fees instead of just sponsorship. Okay, the woman here, if you want to stand up, and then there's a guy back here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just, could you stand uh, up if you type any questions? Sorry. Uh, hi, I'm uh, actually in the uh, publishing business, so uh, what you just said was kind of interesting, but I want to uh, sort of go back to your first idea of sort of bring every brain to the table. And uh, I see that a lot of your content is sort of user generated, uh, not necessarily produced, not necessarily produced by, uh, by professionals. And not everybody knows how to use the equipment, etc. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I wanted to ask you about sort of how do you rationalize the user-generated content, but how do you, uh, in question of quality as well, I mean, we saw HuffPo get rid of its uh, unpaid contributors recently because they couldn't vouch for the content or the sourcing without professionals involved. So how do you balance that out? I think to me it comes down to um, e examples and guidance, right? And so um, to, to come back to a TED example, because those are ones that were kind of fully in the world, there's actually a great example, I'll, I'll give you two, two quick ones, of the TEDx talks, and you can imagine it said we were quite worried when we started having other people run TED conferences. And what they, have do, what they have to come down to is setting guidelines for it, setting a template. So it's not just anybody can produce anything, but here's the bar, here's the structure, here's the format that you, should, you can be creating in. And this is the level that we'll hold it to. This is the, this is the threshold of what we expect in this space. But you, I think one of the traps that people sometimes fall into is thinking that user-generated content has to be a free-for-all. Rather, I think that most things that are volunteer-driven or user-generated succeed best when they have really tight guidelines around them, really tight um, structures for people to fit, uh, uh, to fit into. And so come back again to the, TED, the TEDx events that were held around the wall. There was very strict structure. Talks can't, there can only be one person. It can't be more than 18 minutes. Uh, your sessions have to be this long. Um, you have to film them in this way. You have to put them online. They can't be partisan. They can't be religious. You can't be selling something. So you have to have guidelines. Of, and this actually comes back to the social media of what you stand for. What will you, and this is actually a message of scale last week, and I really believe it. What you tolerate is what you are. So what you, you have to decide what it is that you stand for in your platform and what you expect to, to happen there in this community that you're building by accepting this user-generated content. I want to give you a quick counter example to that, though, which came from the Open Translation Project, which is when we first launched, we, we were just talking about this earlier, we launched with, we seeded the site with professional content, professionally translated content to make sure that we had enough languages and that we set the bar high enough. And, and we worried a lot. You know, we worried our brains out over um, what would happen when we had a mischievous translation card. We didn't speak all of these languages. What would we do? And interestingly, when we launched, the only... Um, uh, mistranslated uh, talk that we had was that there were, there were five talks that had been mistranslated by a professional translator. 
and this was found by one of our volunteers, and they volunteered to, change, to, to retranslate it, and it was fixed. And that was actually the only incident we had of a purposely mistranslated um, uh, talk on the site. Now, that we set things in place with a lot of guidelines and a lot of structure around it, but it is interesting to watch the way these things can, they can work when they're set up with the right constraints around them. I don't know if I spoke exactly to your question, but it was a few thoughts around it. Actually, Michael, do you, do you have, just as a quick follow on that, um, can, can we just get the mic here? Michael, who runs a company like this for many years, uh, how many bad actors are out there doing it, or how do you know that? Michael Smolich from .sub, and we had the honor and privilege. We started off with Pangea Day, if you remember it, Ted. And you, that was the Pangea when the Earth was destroyed, and they had talk uh, meetings in seven continents, and they wanted to translate that into 20 languages, and then it evolved into what was became the TED Open Translation Program. But I just have to g give June a, a great, it started off in one direction, and over about 18 months, there was continuous iteration until it eventually launched as the Open Translation Program. We had starts and stops, and all kinds of different things. She wanted 10 languages originally, and I said we should go to 25 so that people could see the remote languages. And then a, another question which she's talking about was there was a volunteer email, and then get a response, and they had to fill out a questionnaire that June herself wrote. You know, even if it was a convicted terrorist, you don't know, but you had to, it was like a speed bump. And then there was a second person who actually reviewed the first person. And then that person was given instructions. And they had to they given that first person. So there was a whole bunch of iterations until it finally got right. And it was just really, really fascinating how it evolved. Just one comment. We're doing a huge amount of community translation. And the community translation, in many cases, is as good or better than professional translation, because people that volunteer their time are number one, passionate and knowledgeable about the subject. And they want to share that knowledge, which is exactly what you're talking about, open emotion, with other people in their culture that they don't think have the, 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 the benefits of speaking English. So there's a huge amount of emotion involved in everything that was going on. So uh, June really was a, a pioneer in doing this. She, she should great congratulations. Turning, the turning. Um, okay, so we have in the back here, and then we'll go over here. Hi, uh, I'm in. Is this working? Here we go. Hi, my name is Carlos La Madrid. I'm the managing director of um, revenue at Timeout Group um, globally. You talk a lot about storytelling and emotion, and I think emotion is the key to what branding is and what good storytelling is. However, when you look at a global scale, I was wondering, June, if you could talk a little, a little bit about your experience around connecting with people in different cultures and how we evoke emotion in one culture might be different than evoking emotion in another culture. Yes, well, I'm curious which, which aspect of that you, I actually feel like you might have something interesting to say about that particular topic. I, and I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about it. I think that um, certainly when you, um, Anytime you're storytelling across cultures, you run the risk of, of hitting certain traps, right? Things are, honestly, even in the US, it's not just internationally, that there are certain words that you can use that are understood completely different by, differently by one group than another. Um, it's something that we thought about a lot about TED and that we, we bring to our work now of thinking about how do you um, prevent that shutdown, that there are certain ways of talking to, to people, particularly on, on the political spectrum, that um, will just shut down a conversation. If you, if you use particular words or talk about things in a certain way. And, um, and it's worth crafting to kind of get past that. But I'm curious if there's a particular topic that you're, that you're thinking about or that has come up for you that's on, that's front of mind. Well, just, just for example, right? If you're mm -hmm. talking about something like motivation and pride and evoking something, you want to be able to watch something or listen to something and share that. In America, we are a cult culture of exceptionalism, right? So if somebody says, oh my gosh, you're in great shape. And the person says, oh yeah, I've been doing triathlons. You're like, wow, cool. If you do that or say that in some cultures, why well, you're in great shape in Australia, a guy who works from, uh, is from Australia, you would never say, oh, I've been doing triathlons, right? It's understated there. They suffer from the poppy syndrome, if you're familiar with that term. They don't evoke 
achievement and exceptionalism. They don't brag. Americans are braggarts, we're brash. So that might work in our culture. It does not work in that culture. So how do you evoke that emotion? Even though the emotion is the same that you're trying to get, the storytelling has to be different. Yeah. So how do you do that? And how do you know the subtleties of those things? Humility. Like, I honestly think, I think so much of that is in the same way that you think about, like, working natively in a medium that, uh, you know, when we launched the tech radio, we work with NPR. We didn't just decide that we knew everything about radio. We sat down with people who really knew the medium. And it's the same culturally. Um, of a, a, you just re reminded me of a, an interesting TED reference. There's a lot of TEDx talks that are given in other languages. And a number of them we've taken and translated and then released to an English-speaking population. And in watching a lot of the Japanese talks, there are incredible talks from, from TED actually in Japan. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you that like, the first 10 that I watched, um, we, we have this ethos in our American TED Talks of starting strong. You know, that we want this, we, we start the video when the talk really uh, takes off so that people won't uh, get bored and start thinking about something else. And Japanese talks are pretty much the opposite of that. And the first 10 I watched, I was like, we're going to have to cut out this whole first three minutes because it's really long. And then I realized I was thinking about it the wrong way, that there was something, essential, there was something essentially cultural that was happening. And we actually talked to some of our Japanese partners at NHK about that. They're like, no, no, June, you have to understand that's how Japanese people introduce themselves. It would be very rude to just start without letting people know who you are and welcoming them and, and, and having this kind of slow introduction into the talk. So I think it's really important what you're, what you're saying. And I think like humility and partnership are the only ways that I would know to approach that. That's great. Okay, stand up. Let's just see uh, hands of people that want to uh, speak. Okay, that's good. All right, great. Okay, go ahead. Hi, June. Um, my name is Sonica Tiagi, and I do um, social media strategy for solopreneurs and small businesses. And my question is, so obviously there's a hot word, artificial intelligence. And what do you think about its impact for media companies? You talked about, uh, you know, when a media company should really be involving all different divisions, but do you see the technologist having more power, more power in the decision-making process when all divisions come together? Um, I mean, what do you think about just technology's influence in the media space, media distribution, media delivery? Any thoughts on AI? So I have, I'm not sure that I have, it's funny, I know that I have thoughts on AI. I'm gonna to try to think if I can conjure them up at, at, at the moment. The, the broader trend, the, the two things I'd like to share is I actually think that there's something interesting that happens where technologists have a disproportionate amount of power in our culture because they create the devices that have completely changed our lives. And Sherry Turkle is here somewhere who wrote the book Alone Together. Or she, Sherry, Sherry started out as like one of the great techno optimists. Look at this new digital world we have. What will we become in it? And has become one of the most important, I think, cautioners and thinkers about what it's done to us. How, in fact, Sherry, I think you should answer this question. <laughs> we have, I go there. Do you want to answer? Okay. You sure? Okay. <laughs> But this notion that we're uh, alone together is her excellent book that is quoted all the time. And so I think technologists actually have this disproportionate danger. I actually think, I love technologists and technology, as you can tell, but there's a dangerously proportionate power to technologists in our culture because the devices that are being created are uh, have had wildly unintended consequences in our lives. And they are mostly, they're mostly created by young white guys um, with not great social skills. And that has a profound impact on our culture. There is no question about it. Um, however, in media companies, they are disproportionately not listened to. And that's actually part of the problem in, in the media. So within media organizations, I think technologists are ignored and treated like plumbers. Um, but in the culture, they're uh, elevated. And uh, even regardless, it doesn't even matter whether they're ele elevated. They're, uh, it, it, what they do impacts their lives disproportionately. So I'm not sure it exactly speaks to what you were asking, but it's a couple of thoughts in the direction. Go ahead, stand up, please. Um, I'm Alexandra, um, I'm a student at NYU. And I just had a question about the point that you said about, I think your newest project, that's with something with mindfulness, I believe, um, just because when I got to college, I started to do a lot of yoga, but I've never really considered how media plays into mindfulness. I mean, the extent that I've seen um, yoga and meditation and mindfulness in media is basically Instagram, 
women showing themselves doing these crazy moves, you know, <laughs> and that's really all I've seen of it. So I'm just very curious to see, is, you know, what your take is on media and this new wave of health and mindfulness. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, just to speak to that for a moment, I think there's something really, um, there is that a powerful trend right now in the notion of mindfulness. I think it, it's like the flip side, too, of, of technology. We spend so, like, our devices have made us so not present in our lives that we are desperately trying to attach to any practice that will help bring us back into our lives and our bodies and where we are at any moment. And it is, it's like, a, it's, a, it's a plague of non-presence that we, we have because of our, as an unintended consequence of our phones, which we love, but, but that's what they've done to us. And um, so the thing that we're exploring is um, with a couple of great practitioners, so these aren't our own original ideas, we're kind of bringing together people in the space of looking at how mindfulness can be integrated into our daily lives more so that um, I was, I, I always wanted to be able to meditate, but I was just never succeeded at it but have found ways through mindfulness that is less about um, emptying your mind and more about being very present and finding ways to be very um, present and aware of, of, of your senses and your surroundings and the people that you're with. And I think that's the space in which there's something interesting to do in, in media and mindfulness. But it's very of the moment for all kinds of reasons. Right? Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm Jamila Barunji. Um, I work between the US and Africa in line with the SDGs, uh, driving investment into Africa and creating jobs. And uh, I just kind of wanted to add on to what he said about culture. And I feel like Ted really did a good job. Like actually, it's because of Joy Aite's talk at Ted that I decided to go into the line of work that I do because I was just like blown away by the way he uh, did that. And I think that Ted really did a good job about capturing like a very like uh, inclusive narrative so how can we talk about next media and not talk about inclusion? And, you know, the Me Too movement and, you know, stories from other continents, you know, uh, I'll give you an example, Uganda, the country that I come from, has 70% of the population uh, under 30 years old. It's the youngest and fastest growing population in the world. That's just one country. So uh, in terms of next media, like, I live in New York, uh, but my perspective is global. I, I've watched every movie that has been made around Africa, like The Side Eye, worse than Michelle Obama. And I just feel like, you know, I feel like with Ted, they did a great job. And how do we get everybody else to start telling like a real narrative and have some authenticity? And you know, we all think it's funny and whatever, com coming to America is cute, whatever. But like, there's also something missing, like the, the, the narrative of like some of the kids and the youth, uh, you know, they want their story told. So how does, you know, platforms like yours and the people that you encounter gonna address that? Uh, so I, I love that question. And I, I feel like if we did this again, we should have one of the principles should be about diversity. So it's something we believe in super strongly. And the way that we think about it is that if you, we, we believe in diversity, the stories and diversity of voices, but if you want that, you have to hire for it. Right, so you have to have a you have to have investors and a board that are diverse. You have to have a staff that is diverse, and um, and you have to put people in your programs that are diverse. And so we've actually really committed to that in ways that people have found a little bit bananas. Um, so when we launched our company, we actually decided that um, uh, it has to start at the investors and the board. And so we've only done an eight or ten or six people. We've done a round of angel investing. We decided we we were going to have half women and half men on our among our angel investors, and so we did not raise a dime from a man until we had half of our investment money from, from women. Because we know the dynamic that happens. There are many more men investors, just like there are many more men speakers and more uh, and authors and so on. And so we made sure that we had half women first before we brought them in. We had very funny conversations with people saying, sorry, we're not raising money from men yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and people thought we were crazy. They were like, just take the money where you find it. And they're like, what, what are you, like, that's, I mean, that's a great uh, philosophy, but in fact, you actually need to have money, but actually all it takes is to decide. And, um, and that's what we do on Masters of Scale as well. It's, you know, it's, a, it's mostly a tech business show. When we first sat down and drew our list of guests up, it was, who are the most famous names? Who will bring the most audience? It was nine white guys and Sheryl Sandberg. And, and we actually all looked at each other and we're like, that won't do. Why don't we commit to a 50-50 gender balance? And, 
we just decided with Reed and we decided we, and you know, we're the only American media program, only, that's committed to a 50, publicly committed to a 50-50 gender balance. And, um, and it's important because the men will always come in first and um, the, the, the dominant culture will always come in first and the American stories will always come in first. And so if you want diversity, I, I actually am a big believer in committing to it at a board level, at an executive level, at a staff level, at a public representation level and holding yourself to percentages uh, or companies holding themselves to percentages because if you don't commit to the percentage, you will never get there. And we saw that at TED and it's, I'll give you one more detail on that. So at TED, it, it is almost impossible to curate a conference with half women and half women. And the reason isn't what you think. It's not that people don't think about women. It's that every woman says no. So I held a small event once. It was, I invited six, uh, seven men and seven women and six men said yes and six women said no. And that's typical. And look, people had to email me like seven times, by the way, to get me to even respond to an email. But come here, and I like to talk. This is true. <laughs> but, but, but unpack what you just said there. Why yeah. is that? And coming from you, explain I, that. I'll tell it in, in a brief way. I think what happens on the gender front, and it's a little bit differently ethically, but some, I think that's some of the things that things come into play. I think there's a whole set of reasons why women say no uh, to, to, to public speaking, to op-ed writing, and it has to do um, with a set of things. They, they, they won't speak if they're not, they're not ready, so a lot of women would turn down TED if they were not ready. No man ever turned us down because they weren't ready. Um, <laughs> so that's a fact. Um, you might think that it's family, right? So a lot of people are right. Women are moms, and, and they have to stay home, and I did not find that to be true. I had as many men turn me down because they had to stay home and take care of their kids as women, so I actually did not find that to be true at all. Um, what I did find, though, is that women just didn't prioritize it. Women, I, I actually think that uh, women tend to believe that their most important work is in the office with their team, getting their work done and not being out on stage saying, look at me, how great I am. And I relate to that. That's, that's why I've turned down almost every speaking engagement, even though when I talk, it's about why women should say yes to speaking engagements, because <laughs> I personally don't value the, like, I, I, I hope that this helped you here today, and I like it, and it builds my work, and I know it's important, but it doesn't feed me. What I think is my important work is being in the office with my team, but I'm actually wrong. It's not true. My, my work is both. My work is being in the office with my team and being out in the world telling the story, and I just think men and women are a little flipped in what they prioritize there, and that leads to a world in which we appear to have fewer women leaders than we do, because every woman says no, just like me. <laughs> totally... Yeah, I love that explanation. Because <laughs> it, it is a struggle, actually, as, as someone who's run the media company, because we're always trying to do that. And it is true, it took a lot to get you to make it this <laughs> we'll say. Anyhow, we got a guy in the back here. Uh, Dan Gerstein, I'm a recovering Politico, and I know I run a ghostwriting agency called Gotham Ghostwriters. I was also struck by uh, the phrase evoke contagious emotions. Um, beautiful, great aspiration. It's to me, the right bar to set, but I see a different challenge from culture, which is cost, right? Mm. Um, the reality is producing content that evokes contagious emotions is challenging, demands a lot of creativity, and therefore is very expensive. And it's no accident that the things that gets lots of shares and lots of likes and which is making a lot of money for people is cheap, titillating, polarizing content, right? So my, what I'd love to hear your thoughts a little bit about are how do you change that cost structure so that it becomes much more possible for smaller media companies, not just the giants like the New York Times and NPR that you're used to working with, to prioritize and make money in developing contagious content? Yeah, a couple of thoughts, and I, I wonder if there are a few more here, but a couple of things that I'd say, I think that's, that's true, like for example, Masters of Scale, for example, is a very expensive show to, to produce. Um, a couple of ways that, that I would, would think about that is, um, is one is reuse, that if you create media that was expensive to, to produce but it only hits once and then kind of fades away, it'll never be worth it. But if you create things that are excellent from the get-go and figure out ways to reuse and repurpose them. So with, we joke that it's, it's like we use every part of the pig. You know, that we create massive scales of podcasts. We have the transcripts that we take really seriously and we think about how do we, how might we use them in higher education? We uh, think about how do we turn this into an animation? So we think about once we've created something that was expensive, but we 
hope is excellent, how do we reuse it so that it becomes cost effective over time? So our, you know, our cost structure, like what it costs to create massively scales of podcasts, is bonkers. But it's not bonkers once it's relayed to all of these other media forms that it can be um, turned into. And the other way is thinking about the bottom up. You know, thinking about what you can do by, uh, by harnessing what, uh, as I said, you're not, you're getting people to do things for you, but think about what they already want to do. What stories are people already telling on their own online? And how are they telling it? How might you shape that and harness that um, so that your audience is creating alongside you? Um, that was sort of the magic that we discovered at TED because people gave the talks for free and the TEDx talks for free. It's what we're trying to play into in a couple of different places. But those are the two models that we think about is like reuse like crazy and, um, uh, and think about how you can get the audience uh, creating with you. And then the other part is thinking about visionary sponsorships. So I think that anytime you're creating something that is excellent and genre defining and that touches people in that way, there is a sponsor that wants to be alongside you um, and who are willing to pay premium um, uh, uh, dollars to sit alongside you in an authentic way in that space. And so that's the third, third thing to think about is how do you target premium sponsors for a high CPM to be part of that feeling you know, and that, I mean, that's actually what we mostly sold at TED. We did have advertising. Is like, when your when your uh, video appears at the end of a TED talk, everyone is like, "This, they're they're open, they're ready, they they want to take in uh, what it is you're selling." And if you're selling something that they actually want in an authentic way, it's very powerful. So that's the the other thing to perhaps think about. Now, folks, I don't want to keep anyone from the drinks. If you <laughs> bring out more drinks, a little more food down in that area, and we really want to have people talk amongst themselves, including with June. The last question here I just do want to ask you is, when we talked earlier, you talked about how you were hopeful that the next, that media isn't a moment here, that the innovation in media could actually help heal the country or innovate in the, in the broader sense of what's going on in the country. And do you have any last thoughts about that and any thoughts on how hopeful you are where we're at in the media world right now going forward? Yeah, and I think we are in a moment of, of great challenge, but in great challenge, there always comes great opportunity. And I think in, the, in these moments when everything is changing, I think I, I am super optimistic about the ability of very smart people and very smart organizations to look around the bend and figure out where we can go. And these, in these moments when there's there's a lot of darkness, it's actually, A, it's the moment when people realize how much they actually need professional media. Yeah. Um, I believe that. I don't remember what the numbers are, but I, yeah, I have a friend of the New York Times. They, they have seen, they've done wonderful things to their subscriptions in the last year. We People become aware of their need of media in moments like this. But that there's an enormous opportunity because there is a way to tap um, your audience to tap individual stories in ways that you never could before. You can find sources, you can find stories, you can uh, tap into that network in a way that just wasn't possible 10 or 20 years ago. And, um, and it is, I, I believe, by tapping those individual stories and surfacing them that you can begin to heal a fractured, uh, a fractured country and a fractured media environment. So I'm very, very optimistic. I hope you're right. I'm very optimistic too. But um, let's all give June a fantastic. Thank you.